I want to invite you to take your Bibles. Let's open to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. As they wheel the, uh, the TV out and the stage kind of gets set here, I want to put a picture up on the back screen. Yesterday was my 17th anniversary. Yesterday. 17. Yeah. Ashley's not here today. That is not a reflection on how our marriage is doing, all right? Uh, marriage is quite well, and we're uh, very excited about the next days. She's actually home with sick babies. Uh, we, we've tested. They're, they're fine. There's nothing wrong there. I think it's just normal, normal summer, summer cold stuff. And, but uh, I've got some city miles on me. Ashley doesn't look like she's changed all that much. Uh, to my eyes, she is more beautiful than ever. And I am just so thankful for God giving us the gift of marriage. Now, I, I bring this up because yesterday we had plans. We were actually going to go out. We had a sitter all scheduled. And husbands, you know what I'm talking about, where you plan out your anniversary time. And we had it all scheduled. We had it all taken care of. But then the kids started running fevers. And we were like, well, whatever. I guess that's that. We'll, uh, we'll order in. And we ended up just staying home last night. But, but that's a great thought for us to begin with tonight or this, this morning. There is a great opportunity for many things that you love in this life to get canceled. And that holds true not for just events or celebrations. Uh, a lot of things that we're, of the times that we're living in are starting to become canceled. Political views, views, moral views, there's things that, that we hold dear that are actually, as a culture, beginning to be canceled. In fact, I like that, that this picture, there's a, here's a great meme I saw on the internet the other day. It was this guy, he was headed on vacation, and he, he took a picture of himself looking out the window of the plane. If you've seen this one before, you know what's about to happen. This was the second picture. Uh, he had staged, staged the whole thing with a toilet seat and a computer screen, and it wasn't real because his flight had been canceled. And I thought that was, that was hilarious. That was great. Everything in this life is up to be canceled in the times that we're living. The things that we love, the views that we hold, the biblical views, this is a canceled culture, and times are starting, even in these last days, to feel uncertain. Now, the problem is, as a culture and as a church culture, we tend to hide in all the wrong places. You and I feel so insecure in these days because we tend to hide in our resources. We tend to hide in our wisdom. We tend to hide in our ability to provide for ourselves. We think that we can take care of ourselves. And it's because we hide so poorly, we never feel safe. And that ultimately leads us to anger, it leads us to isolation, and it leads us to fear. Well, we have two final sermons for the series that we've been caught up in. This is the series on 2 Thessalonians, standing out when time is running out. We have two clocks ticking all the time, and we, in the midst of these final days, will find ourselves standing out. There will be a cancel culture working against us as we reach these final days. And now we're in chapter 3 this morning. Two final sermons. Thank you. Thank you for letting me preach this book to you. I've never preached it before. I love it. I've learned a lot. I'm thankful for it. But thank you for letting me preach God's Word to you. I just need to say that to you. It's such a privilege. And as we come to the final two sermons, you'll want to be here this week and next week to finish strong. But we've reached the so what portion of the book. Now we're in that section that says, so what? Christ is coming back. There's all these events. There's going to be a great return. There's going to be a rebellion. The end of time is going to end with an apostasy, a falling away. The temple will be rebuilt. The Antichrist will be revealed. There's going to be a retribution. There's even going to be a restrainer removed. We've seen all of that in previous weeks and previous studies. So what? What do we do in light of that as we taste pre-tastes we're not, we're not in, the, in the, the tribulation. We're not in the period of God's wrath right now. But how do we live as we begin more and more to sense pretastes of that time of wrath? We start to feel canceled. Well, we stand protected, not in our resources, but in Jesus' resources. Somebody say amen. amen. It's in Christ's resources. And today we're going to see how He will protect 
His church. And so, would you take your Bible? Let's stand together as we do every week in honor of God's Word. We're in First Thessal or Second Thessalonians, chapter three. Second Thessalonians, chapter three. We're going to look at the first five verses. It says this: Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Somebody say amen. Amen. Before you sit down, I, I have to share this funny story that happened while we were on vacation. Do you watch, do you watch the feed? Do you watch the, uh, the, the, the service when you're out of town on vacation? We, we generally do. We watch it as a family. We watched it this last week as we were away. And uh, during the service, we were all in the living room watching it, and, and we were watching Pastor Justin uh, preach his message. It was awesome, great time in the Word. But there came a moment where Pastor Justin said, and some of you, some of you have a heart for middle school boys. And then he said, God bless you. And then there was this moment of silence. And then my son, my junior high son, said, wait, what? What, what did he just say? Dad, that's messed up. Can you believe he just said that? It was awesome. That was, that was like the highlight uh, of my day, just my son speaking up and realizing he had been singled out. And I, I, lo I loved it. It was so good. It was so, so good. Um, but I want to say this. In these last days, as we get nearer to the end, you will more and more feel singled out. And you'll feel the uncomfortable factor in this culture. You're going to feel out of place. And so the question I want to answer today is where is our protection? Where do the people of God find their shelter, their protection? How do we shelter in place? And here's the phrase I want to put before you. In perilous pretastes, we're not there yet, but in perilous pretastes, we can enjoy peaceful protections. I want to show you three protections of God's grace for these last days for your living. May God bless the reading and the preaching of His Word. Be seated. In your handouts, you have the, uh, the main points written in. I want you to take lots of notes this week, all right, so you'll know where we're going. Number one, if you're taking notes, reach out for partners. Reach out for partners. What partners? Well, notice that we begin talking about prayer partners. Write that down, prayer partners. That's the, really the emphasis of this passage. It begins with the word finally. Now, this doesn't mean that he's nearly done talking. We're still in chapter 3, and it's the very beginning. This isn't like the pastor who says, well, I've, I've come to a final point. I've got one more thing to say. Then he drones on for 30 more minutes, all right? I've never done that. Um, but, but that's not what this is. It really could be translated as for the rest. It's almost like he's saying, look, we've talked about all the return elements of Christ. So what? What do we do in the meantime? What do we do for the rest of time? What do we do for, for this meantime where we're sheltering in, in place? Let's talk about that. And it's interesting, he commands prayer. Notice he says, pray for us. And this is, this is the only Greek imperative for the whole five verses that we're in today. This is the only command that's given. He says, pray for us. And he's using his apostolic authority here. He's, he's sort of bending his authority and he's saying, you have to pray for us. I want you to pray for us. He does this eight other times in the New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, brothers, pray for us. This is something that is to be done routinely, continually within the church. Why do we need to come to church? Why do we need to gather together on Sunday so that we can pray for one another? Why don't we pray for one another more? You might write this word down off to the side. Write down the word humility. Humility. 
I think that's what we see in this command. Pray for us. We see humility. Pray for us highlights Paul's humility. Consider who's asking for the prayer. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the guy who founded this church. This is the guy who evangelized many of these people. This is the guy who actually went to seminary. Caserta's going to seminary, right? Jesus was Paul's instructor. How about that? He went to seminary for three years under Jesus. He's been caught up into heaven. He had seen visions. He had been given direct revelation from God. He had healed people. He had raised the dead to life. In fact, there was this, this weird story in Acts 19 where they literally took the, you know, Paul was a tent maker. They took the, the sweat cloths from the apostle Paul, and they literally would take those and touch people with them, and people would be, be healed of their infirmities. That's a crazy story. I mean, Paul is asking for prayer. That's significant. And I think what that tells us is that you're never too mature, that never so mature that you don't need prayer. Amen? You're never so mature, you're never so long in the faith that you don't need prayer. We need to routinely ask others to be praying for us. We need to aggressively be asking others to pray for us. When we gather here, one of the reasons you need to make the gathering moment of this church a priority is so that we can gather together and pray for one another. We need to lift each other up routinely. Notice he's, who he's asking to pray for him. It's the word brothers. Brothers. Who's that? Well, it's, it's those in the church of Thessalonica. New Christians, baby Christians the most immature Christians out there at this moment. This was a brand new church. They had just come to Christ, and he's saying, I need your prayers. And so this is Paul asking, and look who he's asking, the most immature Christians, those who are still on the milk of God's Word. He's having to teach them and reteach them. We've already seen in this book. I think there's a couple of lessons here. You're never so mature that you're beyond prayer, but also you're never too young to be greatly used in prayer. You're never too immature to be used by the hand of God. Your prayer somehow is a touch point to the will and the power of God for one another, and we need to lean into that regardless of our age, stage, maturity. Amen? Amen. I think Paul shows us several things we ought to pray for. I don't know if you were when you were a kid, if you had this experience, whenever I was at the dinner table, my folks would sometimes say, Matt, why don't, you, why don't you lead us in prayer? And I would end the prayer with like this summary statement that included a ton of people. And Lord, bless all the missionaries and pastors out there. Amen. Just all in one. Just all, not specifics. Paul gets very specific. He doesn't just say, and bless everybody, Amen. He prays for specific needs of ministers and ministries of gospel ministry. Let's look at a few of those. Notice three things with me, and notice the purpose clauses, the word that. Do you see it there in your text? You might circle that or highlight that. It's given us a reason that he prays or he wants to be prayed for. Pray this and this, and we're going to see three things in that section that we ought to be praying for. Number one, if you're taking notes. Pray for the message, that the message would get out. That's the first thing you need to pray for. Pray that the message would get out. Notice that Paul is praying for the Word of the Lord. That's at the very center of his message. The church can get by without a, a certain pastor, a Matt Shackelford, and any other pastor. Pastors are not the main thing in the church. It's the Word of God that does it all. And as we tether ourselves to the Word of God, we'll experience the power of God. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is at the center of this prayer request. We've got to see that. Charles Wesley said it well, God buries His workmen but carries on His work. The person is disposable. The person is temporary, but the Word of God will never fade away. Somebody say amen. amen. It's the Word of God. The Word of God does it all. What does he pray about this message that the Word of God would get out? Well, he prays that it would speed ahead. Do you see that there? That's a very interesting Greek word. It speaks to urgency, speaks to importance, but it really speaks to runners that are, are running un, unhindered. 
I believe Paul loved sports. He, he uses this imagery of a runner constantly. And uh, one of the things he must have been at was probably the Isthmian Games. It's like the Olympics. There were a couple of land masses in Asia, and they were massive land masses. And then, and then oceans were on either side of an isthmus. And right in the middle, there's this track where they would have all of these races. You can still go there today and see it. So I imagine that Paul was probably at those races near Corinth, uh, making, making tents. I imagine he was, he was probably there watching the Greek races. And, and he uses this word to speed ahead. And what that word really means is to run ahead unhindered. To run ahead unhindered. Now, I'm a runner. I, I run a 5K most days of the week, and I, that's just part of my life. But when I run, I like take off every weight I can. I try to get the rings off, and I try to… I got these new shoes that are just super light, and it's so much easier to… You, know, you wouldn't think a pound or two would make a difference, but it does. And what this is saying is that, that runners need to be unencumbered, and sometimes there's even some things in the way that we need to clear out of the way so that we can run fast. I was putting my son to bed just the other night, and I was walking to his bedside, and I stepped on a Rubik's Cube-looking thing and almost killed myself. It's a true story. And I said, son, you got you to pick up your stuff. I'm going to die. You're going to kill your dad. And, uh, and, and that's what he's praying. He's saying, move the stuff out of, out of the way so that there's a clear path for the gospel. Pray that. We need to pray that. Now, speaking of that, I'm going to give us all as a church something we can be praying about as a church. We're really pressing in as a church on the culture, and we're really excited about partnering with uh, ministries that do that. We have a ministry inside the church that our brother Greg Sukert runs. It's his ministry. It's called Anchored North. And he is actually in Los Angeles right now in a studio filming something called Honest Discourse, and we'll put this up on the screen, a couple of pictures where they, they take people with opposing views and try to have a conversation about a Christian worldview. Now, what's really cool about this is that both people get a chance to talk. It's evangelistic, and it's uncensorable by YouTube. You can put this out there, and YouTube and social media people can't censor it because you're presenting both views, and the gospel is shared. And it's a really cool opportunity. Greg is in… Uh, now, you may be wondering, why am I putting a picture of Bruce Wayne and uh, the Batman lair up here from the Dark Knight? That's where they're at. They're in the Batman lair right now filming. Here's a few pictures. But we need to pray as these six conversations are happening uh, that the gospel would go forward because what we're trying to do is present the truth of God's Word in a loving and winning way that we would win people. And then as a church, we actually get a commercial right in the middle. Uh, Central Church will be featured and be given a commercial where we can encourage people to be a part of a local fellowship. Now, these videos have been getting like millions of views. And uh, we're really excited about the gospel getting out in that unique way. And we're excited to be part of that. You need to be praying for this. Be praying that the gospel would indeed speed ahead, that, that all of the obstacles in the way would be cleared out of the way. In fact, Pastor Greg called me the other day and said, um, listen, we're a little concerned because flights have been canceled and, and they're having a shortage of pilots and we've scheduled hotels and studio space and all these different people, celebrities coming in, filming these things. And we just want to make sure everybody's going to make it or else it's going to be a, lot, a waste of a lot of money. So far, they all have, but we need to be praying that the gospel would have a clear path to run so that we can pr produce these things and get the truth out. Amen? Will you pray for that? Amen. Thank you. Notice also the second thing he says to pray for, not only that the word gets out, but that the word gets in that the message of the gospel gets in. Notice this word, to be honored. What he's saying here is that, is that the word, as it is received, is honored in the heart of the hearer. See, people tend to initially reject God's word. When the light of God's word shines on their life, it is at first very 
very difficult to hear. It is, conf- it is confrontational. It tells us that we have a problem, and it becomes very uncomfortable. People do not want to be confronted with the Word of God. People do not want to be confronted with, with the, the moral commands of the Word of God. People tend to cover. Now, when I was in Ohio, I had a, a house, and I took out some walls in the house. And I remember Ashley was, was like at a trip to the supermarket, and I decided to take this wall out, and I had it removed by the time she got back. You can do a lot of damage with a sawzall, amen? And you can get a, a wall out pretty fast. But I got it out of there, and, and I had it sitting on the front porch, but Ashley walked in, and, uh, and there was this strip that I had not replaced the flooring or the carpet, and I did what any self-respecting husband would do. I took a massive rug and just covered it up, amen? Dads, you know what I'm talking about. And I just covered the, the hole in the floor, the hole in the, in the flooring up, and we'll get to that later. That's what a lot of people tend to do when it comes to hearing the Word of God. It addresses true issues, issues of morality, issues of moral commands, and they don't want to hear it. But they need to. Because you've got to hear the bad news if you're ever going to hear the good news. You've got to hear the need if you're ever going to sense your need for Christ, right? You've got to hear the bad news that we're all sinners, we're all broken, we've all broken God's law. If you're listening in right now, this is the gospel that saves. We're all messed up. Every single one of us. Somebody said amen. You need to say amen a little bit louder, amen? We're all messed up. Every one of us. We've all broken God's law. We have issues. We have problems. We have moral failures. Every single one of us in this room. But we don't leave you there. We bring in the rest that Jesus Christ is God's perfect Son who takes away and changes sinners into the image of His Son. That Jesus will clean you up. That Jesus will fix you. That, that Jesus will, will give you the very thing that, that you need most. Jesus will give you eternal life. You see, God sent His perfect Son, Jesus, to die on a cross in your place for your sin. There was a great exchange that took place so that the moment that you trust in Him by simple faith, not by works, but by simple faith in Jesus Christ, you gain the gift of eternal life, and God sanctifies and changes every single person that He saves. Amen? That is the message of the gospel. We pray for people that when they hear, when they're confronted with truth or moral truth of the Bible, They would sense their need of a Savior. Truth has always been rejected. They rejected Jesus. They rejected the apostles. They rejected the prophets. One of the ways that Satan silences God's messengers is by twisting Matthew 7. Someone asked me about this at the Jeff Kinley event. Matthew 7. And uh, someone said they were having a discussion with another person saying, what about that verse that says don't judge? Maybe we shouldn't be talking about moral issues because we shouldn't judge. Well, friends, that verse is actually about hypocrisy. The Bible's really clear. We do need to be judging, but have righteous judgment, not like the judgment of the Pharisees, a righteous judgment that leads people to Christ. We give the bad news so that we can give them the good news. We give them the bad news, we're failing, we're all broken, so that they can receive the good news. The Bible says in John 7 and many other passages that we're required to judge, but without hypocrisy. The Bible says to judge with righteous judgment, John 7. Judge all things, John 7. Judge sin within the church, 1 Corinthians 2. Judge matters between brothers, 1 Corinthians 6. Judge preaching, 1 Corinthians 14. Judge false spirits and those who preach false doctrines, 2 Corinthians 11. Judge works and workers of darkness, Ephesians 5. Judge false prophets and false apostles, 2 Peter 2. 1 John 4, Revelation 2. Judge false Christians among us, 1 John too. Friends, God is actually calling us to give righteous judgment because why? You've got to give the bad news in order to get to the good news. That we've all broken God's law. We've all fallen short. We're all messed up, each of us in our own unique way. 
But the gospel saves all who would trust in Christ. And God would do this great exchange, all of Jesus' righteousness for all of our sin. You can have that today. And I would encourage you to reach out to Jesus Christ, to call out to Him. All who call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, will be saved. And you'll receive the grace of God this very day. So we need to pray that the Word gets in. And notice Paul's not done. He, he gives an illustration of what it looks like. He says, as happened among you. He's referring back to the first letter that he wrote in 1 Thessalonians. Over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, he says, you received the Word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it not as the Word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God. We need to pray for the message that it gets out. We need to pray for the message that it gets in, that people would receive it as the Word of God. Third prayer request, write this one down. We also pray for the messengers, the messengers of God's Word. Now, this one just makes sense to me. In order for the message to get out and for the, the Word of God to get in, you've got to have feet of people carrying that good news to other people, right? You've got to have people who are messengers. There was a preacher one day who said, uh, I'm just God's errand boy. I'm just God's messenger boy. That's a good way to think of things. I'm just God's messenger boy. That's what I am. Notice there it says, it says there that there are wicked and evil men. That refers to stubborn or unreasonable people in the church. Uh, people, one commentator called these people wicked and evil men. Uh, he used the words morally insane. How many of you would say we're living in morally insane times? Anybody? No one. No one. Yeah, everybody. We're all, we're all, this is obvious. We're living in morally insane times. I mean, people are crazy today. It is a crazy period to be alive because you feel us as a culture going backwards. When you take biblical positions, there, there will come attacks on you. Notice Paul's prayer for the messengers is, is uniquely shaped and crafted around the mission. Look at verse 2. For not all have faith. He's not praying specifically for the protection of the messengers just because they need protection, but it's for the sake of the mission. There are people out there that need the gospel. There are people out there that need the faith, that need faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul knows that not everyone believes. That includes people who are in the fellowship of the church. J. Vernon McGee said it well. He said, I find that the spreading of the gospel is hindered by pe more by people in the church than by anything else. No liquor industry, no bar room, no gangster ring has ever attacked me. So-called saints in the churches attack me. Pray for safety. Adrian Rogers said it well. It's the termites within, not the woodpeckers without. I think that's a good way of seeing it. A lot of times there will even be people in the church that will attack. And so, so how do we apply this first, this first point? We need to be asking for prayer constantly. Paul does that. One of the ways you can do that is partner with each other every time you come to church, all throughout your week. We need to ask each other for prayer. Some of you need to ask God right now, right where you're at, say, God, give me the humility to do that. Sometimes I'm embarrassed. Sometimes I don't want to admit what's really going on in my life. I don't want to tell someone else. I don't want to tell someone else I'm struggling in this area of my life. I'm struggling. And you've got to have the same humility that Paul had to ask for prayer. Start asking. Let me show you something really fun. By the way, there'll be some people after this service right over here if you would like to be prayed with, we're going to have some pastors and some elders standing by right over here. We would love to pray with you, but we would also love to pray with you anytime. We've included something new in the bulletin. This is something I've been wanting for a long time, but on the back of the bulletin, there's a phone number. Do you see that? It's this 901-255-8295. Uh, That's the phone number, all right? What is that? Well, we have a flip phone. How, how long has it been since you've seen a flip phone? One of these guys right here. So don't call right now. You'll interrupt my sermon, all right? But we are going to pass this around the pastors and the elders of Central Church. 
And every week, a different pastor or elder is going to be on call, day or night. You can call us. We will pray with you. If there is a need, we would love to talk to you. Here's your direct line to a leader at Central Church, all right? We want to be available to you, and we want to be accessible to you. And so if you need to pray with someone, and you'd like just a brother to lift up your needs, or if you'd like to schedule a time with one of our wives, we want to do that to intercede for you. And so that is another way that you can do that. But we need to step forward in that area and be like Paul and ask for it. Second, I think we need to expect opposition. Paul was told that every single city that he goes into, every single city, he would be rejected, he would be opposed, he would be ridiculed, he would be hurt. That's a difficult way to do ministry, but that's a normal way to do ministry. That's normal. The culture has never been friendly to Christianity. What we've experienced for the past 200 years has really been an anomaly in church history. Christians are always under attack. And so we need to lean into that. We need to constantly be faithful to give that message away. We've got to present the bad news so that we can get to the good news. And even if we get canceled, we have to continually present those truths. Another application is you need to pray for elders and pastors, the leaders of Central Church and other churches very often. There are unique burdens. Uh, One pastor called it the blessed burden. It is a blessed burden. Uh, There is a spiritual warfare element to ministry happening all the time, and you need to pray for us, and we ask you to pray for us. I tell you, difficulty and discouragement is a way of life for anyone who's in the ministry. I, uh, I put this meme up the other day, or this, this far side cartoon. I like this. Tim and I were talking about this. This is what ministry feels like right here. It's two spiders at the end of a children's playground slide building a web, and they say at the bottom, if we pull this off, we're going to eat like kings. We'll eat like kings. And it's just this impossible picture of, of their, what, what's going on in their mind. That's what ministry feels like a lot. It's just impossible. We're trying to do something that unless God does it, we can't pull it off. So we need your prayer. And I want to say this to you, church family. One of the things I love about this church is that I feel your prayers. I know you're praying for me. I get text messages and emails all the time. Glenn calls me, texts me, tells me he's praying, Barry does. Uh, Several guys within the congregation tell me all the time, Marla, she'll give me a text message every once in a while. She's praying for me. I'll have Frank come up to the front and put his arm around me and say, I'm praying for you, pastor. I'm praying for you. And we feel that. I just want to say this to you. Thank you. Thank you. It is such a joy to do ministry at Central Church where you pray for your staff, where you pray for your pastors, where you pray for your elders. But I would encourage you, you need a prayer list of these people. I've got one that I I think through and work through every Sunday morning, different preachers in the pulpit. My friend Pat Nimmers, I pray for my friend Philip DeCourcy and Mark Hitchcock, and I pray for guys who are in the ministry. I pray for our pastors. We've got great, great pastors that I work with and have the privilege to work with that serve all of us, and I want you to be praying for them as they do the work of the ministry here at Central Church. Pray for our elders. But we ought to have a constant prayer list. And by the way, that's why a church directory is really helpful. It might even be time to resurrect that element and bring up a church directory so that you can like work through it. Amen. So you can work through it and pray for one another. We need that. We need that. We need to be praying for each other. That's one of our safeties that God has given us, that we'd reach out for partners. Number two, if you're taking notes. Number two, let's reach out for promises. Let's reach up for promises in verses 3 and verse 4. Notice in verse 3, how do I gain peace in days like these? Well, it's first knowing who God is. If you have a man-sized God, you will have God-sized anxieties. If you have a man-sized God, you will have God-sized anxieties. You've got to know who God is. Look at verse 3. We see in this verse, He's the Lord. This is a very interesting verse. First of all, it could have used the word Jesus, but it calls Him the Lord. 
He's sovereign over all your trials, over all the things happening in your life. He's Lord. He's master over every bit of it. And even here, it, this phrase appears constantly in the Bible and in the New Testament, but usually it's the word God is faithful. God is faithful. Here it's the Lord is, is faithful. Now that tells us that, that Jesus is co-equal, truly, fully God, three persons, one essence. It's in knowing who He is. Tons of verses on God's faithfulness throughout the Bible. You, you know, it says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24, that the one who calls you, He is faithful. He will surely do it. Another one. Let's go to the next one here. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant steadfast love. That's what Deuteronomy 7 tells us. God's loyal love is constantly working for His people. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13, it says that if we are faithless, let's say that we fail. How many of you failed this week? I'll raise my hand. Yeah, we, again, we, we're all failing all the time. But the good news is that Jesus is unfailing. He remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I love this one. Great counseling verse. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. Now, notice it doesn't say a way of escape. It says the way of escape. Like there is a specific out, a specific way of escape with whatever temptation that you're struggling with, particular to you. God has been so good and so faithful to give you the way of escape. God is faithful. 1 John 1, 9, He's faithful. He's a faithful partner to forgive us our sins. How in our passage is God faithful? Look at verse 3. Notice verse 3 with me. It says He will guard us against the evil one. So He establish, establishes us, but He also guards us against the evil one. Now, this is really important. That doesn't mean that you're not going to receive attacks in your lifetime. That doesn't mean that you're going to have great days all the days of your life. You're going to have some difficulties. You will have a terrible Tuesday or two. You will have some very difficult seasons throughout your life. But the good news is, is that when we face those seasons, you'll never face them alone. And God's always redeeming those seasons to craft something great in your life. You know, it's a well-known fact that the most scarred date palm trees, the ones with the most scars on their bark, produce the sweetest fruit. Did you know that? Isn't that interesting? There are farmers at date palm tree farms, and they will intentionally scar the bark of these trees. Why? To get sweeter fruit. Why did, why did God make it that way? I think it's so that pastors would have great illustrations on the difficulty of life. <laughs> that is a great illustration of what your terrible Tuesday is all about. Why does God allow that to happen? Well, God knows that your circumstances may not be what you want, but it does produce the you that He wants. God uses your difficult job. God uses your difficult moment in your family. God uses your difficult diagnosis in order to draw you to Himself and shape you into the image of Christ. Maybe this is why you came today. Let me just say this to all of you today. You're going through something tough? You're in the midst of something difficult? Had a hard week? Had a hard month? Hard life? God is faithful. It is not wasted. It may not be the situation that you wanted, but God is using that situation to make the you that He wants. And we can rest in that promise. For Paul, he was given a thorn in the flesh. Remember that? Paul, I don't want you getting, I don't want you getting haughty. I don't want you getting proud. So I'm going to give you this hard thing in your life. Why? 
so that you'll be humble, this thorn in the flesh. You've seen all these visions. You've seen all this revelation that's come to you about heaven and about the future, and, and then you're going to write on it, and, and you've had so much revelation. I've got to give you something to make the you that I want. God does that. And He's doing that in all of us to one degree or another right now. That's a great promise. It's not wasted. It's not wasted. It was about 10 years ago that, that I was having, I think, the most difficult moment of my life, and I've told you about it before. I thought I was going to lose my wife, Ashley. We were in the hospital. We were grieving because the diagnosis was not looking good. The doctor came in. How bad is it, doc? 10 out of 10. It's that bad. Okay? We're watching for this, this, and this. And they gave us it all, and we just sat in that hospital bed, and we just wept. And it didn't get better for a long time. I mean, it was… Uh, we were in the hospital a couple of weeks. We were, we were uh, at home. She actually stayed in bed. It must have been like three months she was in bed, and it was so just difficult. People from the church had to come in, and they had to help us, and help us with the children. And God was so faithful even in the midst of that time. But I remember going into the office one day, and I was just despondent. I was just exhausted, just angry, to be honest with you, frustrated by life. Went into my office, my terrible Tuesday. I got there. I shut the door. Well, before I shut the door, I wrote a sign out and taped it to the door. And it was something like, I can't remember the exact verbiage, but it was something like, do not disturb, big block letters. <laughs> like, I just wanted to just sulk in it. Just for, you ever get like that? I just wanted to sulk in it for just a little bit, all right? Shut my door. And I, I promise you, it wasn't five, maybe ten minutes later that my friend Pastor Dave just burst into the door. Hey, Shaq, what's going on? I was like, Dave, do you not read, do you not read the sign? just trying to get some alone time. He said, yeah, I saw the sign. I don't care about that. Anyways, um, <laughs> let's go get a taco or let's go get some Thai food. And it was probably Thai food, I think, but we ended up going and I'll never forget that conversation. He just kind of, just kind of looked at me and preached to me the promises of this passage. I, I don't know what God's doing in your life. I have no clue. But I do know this that the Bible promises us that no matter the difficulty, no matter the rejection, no matter the trial, no matter the pain, nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. It may not be the circumstances that you want, but God is working in the circumstances for the you that He wants. God's doing something. That's one of the defining moments of my life. If you came to church today and you needed encouragement for your trial, just know this simple phrase, God has promised that He's going to use these hard things in your life to make the you that He wants. See it in verse 4. It says, and we have this confidence in the Lord about you, that you're doing and will do the very things, the things that we command. Paul's confidence is not specifically in the Thessalonians. He finds his confidence in their maturity in the Lord. He wasn't counting on them. He was counting on Him. I can count on God to mature you. And I can see over a lifetime. I've got so many stories on this just in my own personal life. I remember when I was first starting out in ministry, I've been in ministry somewhere close to 21, 22 years, and I remember when I was first starting out, I was asked to, to do a wedding. I had tons of convictions when I first started ministry. The problem was that I had to learn over time that most of the convictions I initially held were wrong, and uh, I, had to, I had to learn that many of my convictions were more like folk theology, and I, wasn't, I, I needed to learn God's Word. It's things I'd picked up outside of God's Word. This person came to me, a friend came to me and, and said, hey, would you, would you do my wedding? And there was an issue there, and there was a divorce, and I just said, look, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not doing that, blah, blah, blah. And then later, I read 1 Corinthians 7, and I really study that, and I was like, oh, wait a second. 
God makes an allowance for that. Like God actually, there are some things that God does allow remarriage, and I was totally out of context there, and I was totally wrong in that place. And I had to actually go back to that person and say, I am so sorry. Would you forgive me? I held a view that was extra biblical. Would you forgive me? And they did. And there are those moments where it took time for God to work that out of me, but that's the confidence we have, that, that there are promises that God is working. And so watch this. Is there anybody in your life right now you're frustrated with? Is there anybody in your life being un, unbiblical right now? Is there anybody? Yeah, you don't need to point fingers. Stop that. Uh, is, there, is there anybody in your life? Several of you doing that there. Um, is there anybody in, in your life right now that you have to really you have to really trust the Lord with and say, Lord, you've got that person, now mature them. Mature them. And you can trust. You can trust that God will. That's been me. It's been all of us. We're all messed up people who need the gospel. These are great promises. We have this confidence in the Lord. In the Lord. He who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. Amen? Last point, and we'll, we'll close with this, and I'm serious when I say that. We'll close with this. We need to reach in for power. And when I say in, I really mean to God's Word. Notice that Paul offers two directions for them to gain power for their living in the days that they live. First, they need to know the, the love of God. Let's put that up on the screen. The love of God, the love of God, and to the steadfastness of Christ. This is high altitude truth. The love of God, you need to know, and I hope you have time in God's Word every week where you're studying and growing in your knowledge of God's love for you. Are you going through something difficult? Are you going through a pretaste of, of wrath? Maybe are you going through a difficult season where you're like, man, this is hard. It's not the tribulation yet, but it's hard. Feels like it in some ways. You need to know the love of God. And you also need to look at the steadfastness of Christ. Look at the example of Christ who experienced hell for you and was faithful. Read First Peter, how he opened not his mouth to revile back. When he was struck, when he was hurt, look to his example. This is the high altitude truth. Did you know, did you know that sports teams will actually take their entire football team or lacrosse team or whatever, and they'll go to, you know, somewhere in the mountains, and they'll train way up high. And the reason they train way up high is that they condition their bodies, and medically there's some explanation for this, but they condition, they condition their bodies to get used to that high altitude uh, breathing, and then when they come back down low, they, they, they play like Superman. Like, they just feel like so much more energy. They do that intentionally. We need to live up high in these two truths. We need to live up high that the love of God, in the love of God and in the steadfastness of Christ, and that will make us win down low. Amen? As we close this morning, I want to put a picture up on the screen. I just think this is so good. Back in 1992, Derek Redman shocked the world when he didn't win the 400-meter sprint. He was a shoe-in for the gold medal. How many of you actually remember this moment on, on national television? Just an amazing moment. He blew his hamstring or something in his, in his leg, and, and he started just hobbling and just knelt down, and everybody else finished, finished the race. But he's just struggling. Eventually, he gets up, and he sort of hobbles his way to the finish line, and his dad, this is his dad, runs out and runs alongside him, and his dad says to him, son, you, you don't have to do this. And Derek said, dad, yes, yes, I do. I've got to finish. Then we'll do it together. This is a great image for verses 1 through 5. Is life hard right now? Has it been a terrible week, terrible month, terrible life, difficult season? Your father comes alongside you and says, let me help you, and let's do this together. How? He offers His partners. He offers His promises. 
and he offers his power for all who have trusted in Christ. Heads bowed, eyes closed as the team comes out. All of us in one way or another need to respond today. I think collectively, every single one of us needs to recommit to asking others to pray for us. Paul gives us that example. Maybe before you leave, you need to come up to the front with one of our elders, one of our pastors, and say, I just need to be prayed for. You can do that after the service. You can do that during the song. You can do that right now. Pastors, elders, would you just come up to the front and be available? They're going to be right off to the stage. Ask for it. And offer it as well. Maybe you need to have a list of people that you need to be praying for. Those you know who are in the ministry, pray that the message of the gospel would speed ahead. Pray that the message of the gospel would be cleared of obstacles. Would you just pray that? Maybe you just need to dwell on the promises of God, that God is faithful. No matter how bad it looks right now, God is faithful faithful. Maybe you need to dwell on the love, the steadfastness of Christ. Train up high so you can win down low. Or maybe today you need to believe the gospel for the very first time. If that's you, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's that every single one of us are broken, are lost, when we're born, we're, we're born into this world lost. But the good news of the gospel is that God sent His Son to rescue us from our sin, to rescue us from our failure. And if you would cry out to God with a genuine heart right now, He would save you from that sin. He would save you from the consequences of your sin. He would redeem you and give you the gift of everlasting life. And the moment that you do that, You'll be saved, you'll be secured, and God will complete this work of salvation in you because all that He saves, He sanctifies. Father, I lift up my friends here this morning. I thank You for the truth of this message, Lord. I pray that it's challenging to all of our hearts. Father, make us a people who hunger and thirst for You. Make us a people within cancel culture, within times where things that we love, the morals that the Bible promotes, the Christian worldview, it's all under attack. But Father, help us to be steadfast and immovable in the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Father, would you give us afresh today a knowledge of our protection, even as we walk these last days. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this message to our hearts today. I ask that you would bless all of these words. May they find rooting. May they find lodging in our hearts. May they work our way, their way into our hearts. May we apply them in Jesus' name. And all God's people say it together. Amen.